Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. So what happens in the Carolinas in the summer? Are policy and business priorities like transportation, education, health care, jobs, etc., relegated to be subordinate to seasonal plans like beach and family vacations? Do the hotter and lazy days of summer trump our drive for business development? Or are the acute interests and issues of the day just not as closely followed? Welcome again to the most widely watched source of public policy and business in the Carolinas. I'm Chris William, and this time our experts discuss the issues that matter most. And later on, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina boss Brad Wilson returns. Major funding also by Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Ted Pitts from the South Carolina Chamber of Commerce, Clyde Higgs from the North Carolina Research Campus, and special guest, Brad Wilson, President and CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina. Now, here's Chris Williams. Hi, welcome to our program. Happy summer. Clyde, good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Ted, welcome. It. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, guys, let's start with economic development. In, in, in South Carolina, matter of fact, Ted, and you might have heard this, North Carolina's uh, Secretary of Commerce, John Scavarla, said it publicly, he said, South Carolina is kicking North Carolina's tail. And I think that's probably a good way to say it. South Carolina has had a bunch of wins, not just Volvo and Daimler-Benz and then Boeing before that, but, but Boeing and Firestone and the aerospace and automotive defense, and, and not just that either. But um, so... You know, your former boss, Governor Haley, Nikki Haley, has done, along with Bobby Hitt, has done a, 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 a very admirable job. Here's, here's the question, Ted. Um, with a lot of great wins, you know, um, we'll cover up a lot of sins in operationally how things work. So how does South Carolina get down to the business of making sure and fixing education and transportation? How do you do that? So the first thing I tell you is the reason a lot of those marquee industries are coming to South Carolina, marquee companies are coming to South Carolina is because of our workforce. So they recognize the workforce in South Carolina can do those jobs. And they look at the track record. If you look at BMW, which has been there um, a while, and Boeing now, which has been very successful, you know, they look at those models and they know that if, you know, they're gonna invest a large investment in a state, South Carolina's a good state to partner with to do that. But you're correct, workforce is something that you have to focus on, and that starts at the K-12 level. Um, so one thing you've seen with us do in South Carolina, and first of all, our state agencies and local governments work very closely together on any economic development deal, which I think a lot of people would tell you is different than a lot of other states. So we have partners, everybody's seen as a partner in South Carolina, and they work towards the goal. But if you look at workforce and what we have to do in South Carolina, um, the Department of Employment and Workforce, which um, back in 2010, switched from the old unemployment office to actually the reemployment office. Um, we provide resources through Ready SC and our technical colleges that are able to produce workers um, that can do the jobs that are coming. And I'll, and I'll continue to tell you, the General Assembly focuses on K-12 education. We continue to make some strides with Molly Spearman as a superintendent of education, the new superintendent of education. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of confidence in what's going on in the state related to education and workforce development. Do you feel like Jay, you know, Jay Lucas, new speaker of the house has been able to, to lay out some things and uh, wasn't as 
uh, wasn't as productive as they'd hoped, and certainly transportation, they did move the needle on transportation this session, but maybe not as much as many people had hoped for. It didn't turn out to be quite the priority as it, it was hoped for at the beginning of this session. So again, back to this issue about transportation, how critical is it to get that fixed, even in light of all these great economic development you know, announcements? Tra transportation, when you look at what business folks are talking about, the Chamber of Commerce, us, the South Carolina Chamber, we put forth our competitiveness agenda. And um, in the past, it's been six or 10 things long. This year, it was two things long. It was workforce development and transportation. And I think if you talk to CEOs and businesses across the state, small and large, mm -hmm. that our infrastructure is key to continuing um, the progress that's been made on the economic development front. And you know, the legislative process is the legislative process. But I will tell you that I believe, you know, if you look at what Speaker Lucas has done on transportation and you look at what they've worked on in the Senate, and, you know, I believe that, um, that they recognize that issue and, and we've got to address infrastructure in South Carolina. Clyde, we need to get you in this dialogue. So sure, North sure. Carolina Research Campus, sure. by the way, congratulations on becoming Director of Operations. Well, thank you, thank you. You've been on the point of the spear of business development there for a while, sure, but now you sure. get to you get the whole, run the whole absolutely. enchilada. So absolutely. How does the research campus factor into the dialogue in North Carolina around economic development? And, and let me further add sure. fire to this question. Um, so North Carolina has been debating and finger pointing that their their economic development machine is not going in the way that they sure, hoped. Sure. How, how do you how do you help? How are you a solution? And how do you fulfill the full potential of that research campus in that? Way? Yeah, fair fair question. So so if you look at what businesses care about, so I mean let, let's be be quite honest. They care about the university system, the education system, the workforce development system. Uh, through the community college, uh, the incentives. I mean, that that's a part of the whole pie as well. But what the North Carolina Research Campus is trying to do a little differently, and this is very unique, Chris. Uh, most entities like us don't really have this strategy. So we try to add value to companies that are looking at North Carolina from a product development, from a research collaboration standpoint. So when we talk about some of the companies that we've attracted to Kannapolis in North Carolina, our, our pitch isn't necessarily, you know, the, the type of incentives that you're going to receive. It's not necessarily, you know, about the real estate. It's about come to our state and we will put you directly next to the universities where you can do collaborative research. And ultimately, those companies can pull a lot of those discoveries, a lot of those technologies out of our universities and then commercialize that and then turn it into a new product. And then once that happens, if Kannapolis is really the center of gravity for that activity, guess where the, the new manufacturing site is going to take place? Pretty much it's gonna take place in that same proximity of where that technology was founded. So, so Clyde, how, how do you and your group kind of wade into this dialogue? We were talking to Ted about transportation and education. Sure. How do you wade into that dialogue in North Carolina? And not just in a policy way, but in a real way, how do you say, guys, we need to fix this roads issue? Absolutely. Well, I mean, again, economic development is, is our language. So we're just trying to communicate what businesses care about. And that's what they talk about. They talk about education. They talk about workforce development. Uh, they talk about transportation. Because we can have all of these pieces of the pie together, but if you're missing one of them, you know, the research camp is, is wonderful, but if it doesn't really fit the transportation needs of that company, you know, all the research that we do, all the incentives that we provide, if the transportation system is not to their liking, then they're gonna go elsewhere. So we're just trying to communicate that to policymakers about what businesses really care about. Yeah, okay, guys, uh, stay with us. We're gonna bring our guest on and, and, you know, between healthcare, between education, between transportation, we plenty, plenty to talk about. Sure. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank coming you. up on our program, gosh, uh, the next couple of weeks, the next few months are going to be very exciting. Uh, we talked a little bit about South Carolina uh, it's, uh, it's Secretary of Commerce, Bobby Hitt. He is going to be on this program. Uh, had him on years ago before he became Secretary of Commerce. He'll be here again. Uh, also, speaking of Secretaries of Commerce, John Scavarla is North Carolina's Secretary of Commerce. He will be here also, but separately. And then together, North and South Carolina Superintendent of Education, Molly Spearman from South Carolina, and June Atkinson from North Carolina will be together on the same program. Health insurance providers are clearly at ground zero in this new reality of health care, especially in year two of the Affordable Care Act deployment. 
Anecdotally, there are stories of anywhere from biblical increases in cost to something meaningful, but not quite as epic. But more importantly, where to from here? With this new calculus in healthcare cost, how do you standardize that? Or is there more uncertainty in, in the near term? Joining our dialogue now is President and Chief Executive Officer of Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina. We welcome Brad Wilson. Brad, welcome. Thank you, Chris. Good to be back. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, in all fairness, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina is an underwriter of this program, and that's important to know for full disclosure. Brad, let's come back to year two of the Affordable Care Act deployment. Mm -hmm. um, one of the important demographics was that younger demographic, Gen X and, of course, above that. Where are, not just you, but where's the healthcare industry in the, in the enrollment of that, and how critical is that demographic in making all the numbers work with this new model that we have? Well, the evidence uh, is trending in the wrong direction in that regard. While there were certainly more young people that entered the exchange marketplace, the ACA marketplace, if you will, this year than last year, it is still not at a sufficient rate or magnitude to make a material difference uh, on the economic formula. Um, here in North Carolina, we find ourselves uh, entering year uh, two, mm -hmm. uh, b continuing to be in the top five in the country uh, in ACA federal exchange business. Uh, the good news there is that that means there are more North Carolinians, at least at Blue Cross Blue Shield, in excess of 500,000 many of which are getting their health insurance coverage through uh, the ACA mechanism. But what we are learning is that those that are accessing care through that are older and less healthy than what was anticipated. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, the jury is still out. It's going to take a little mm -hmm. longer, but uh, if there are any young people listening, mm -hmm. I would encourage you to pay attention to this subject for your own good. Uh, and uh, the more younger, healthier people that are involved in this uh, uh, endeavor, the better for all of us. So, so does that does that surprise you that it's the lag for that for that demographic sign up? Does that surprise you? And how much does that undermine a, a healthy, affordable care act? Well, it, it's an important equation. It's not at the beginning and the end. It's it's not a silver bullet for the, the uh, many of the challenges that the ACA face. But it's one it's one dimension. Does it surprise me? Not necessarily. Uh, the evidence would show even before the ACA that younger people, uh, and we were probably all of that mind at one point, mm -hmm. that we're going to live forever, never going to get sick, bulletproof, whatever the uh, <laughs> phrase is that you want to use. It's not top of mind. They're just starting their career. Uh, they're making choices about where to spend the money that they are beginning, beginning to earn. And uh, health insurance and health protection is not, at, uh, not on the top of their mind. Uh, so it's not surprising, but it's certainly unfortunate. Ted, mm. questions? Yeah, um, Brad, you know, businesses, the number one expense is payroll. The number two expense now is health care. Um, as businesses look to try to focus on wellness, what needs to be done in the wellness area to keep, a, I guess, a workforce um, well, which keeps them cheaper to um, less days off and, and less expensive to insure. What would you suggest on that front for the business community? Well, I get the opportunity to speak to this frequently, so let me start with all of us individually. Uh, take better care of yourself. Mm. Secondly, take better care and talk to your family, those that gather around literally your dinner table. Uh, make health and wellness a, a centerpiece of not only what is being served at that table, but your entire activity. And then beyond that, what, what's the role of the employer? Uh, we are seeing across our state, and my guess is it's the same in South Carolina, a growing interest and appetite about what employers can do, right time, right way, to reward and incent and educate their workforce on the importance of being healthy. It impacts productivity, it impacts the bottom line in terms of productivity, as well as the cost of, uh, of, of health care. Uh, education is a huge piece. Uh, you were already talking about that a little bit earlier. If we could all remember what we were taught in third grade health and do it, we would be in a much different place. And I know that all health insurers, uh, us included, uh, have an array of uh, products and services that we can work and collaborate with employers to try to deploy to that end. Clyde? 
Yeah, so, um, so I've got a, a little bit of a different question for you. So at the research campus in Kannapolis, we, we work with the startup community. We have Fortune 500 companies there that are doing research, but we also have small companies that are doing research and mostly on the preventive medicine side. So is there any advice that you can give uh, a healthcare entrepreneur, uh, an innovative company that's coming up with a new product or service on the wellness side, mm -hmm. what should they be thinking about when they're developing this new product? What should they be thinking about with regards to the payer at the end of that equation, if you will? Well, we, uh, yes, I'm a, very familiar with all the robust activity that, that you're leading in, uh, on your campus. And the same thing's happening across the state, I'm sure in South Carolina, and particularly in the Research Triangle. So we engage with entrepreneurs on a regular basis Good. trying to, to help them brainstorm. I would say two things. Make sure that that which you're lurk, work, working on uh, has the potential of making a material difference. Mm. Uh, is it just doing the same thing a different way or is it actually advancing the ball? Is it making a difference? And if it was commercialized mm -hmm. and could be commercialized, what would be the size of the impact? Number two, uh, yeah, how are you, what is your financial model? Uh, how is it uh, we, uh, that you will be financially successful? We see a lot of ideas that are, that are uh, good ideas, but they're premature, and they've leaped to the question of how can we get the insurer to pay for it? Right, right. Well, that's the wrong question at the wrong time. Right. If and in the event there is a clinical delivery mechanism mm -hmm. or a, a new thing, if right. you will, that will increase quality mm -hmm. and lower cost, by definition, it will track the attention of both the provider community as well as the payer community, and uh, the answer to that question gets a whole lot easier when you can see real results. Sure, sure. Why does that get, you, you know, you articulate that well, and I'm sitting here thinking, yeah, that makes sense. Then why does that get lost in the dialogue? Um, well, let me, let me go back to something. So you often use the term, there's a revolution in the healthcare industry. Mm -hmm. Is that because there is a cultural shift, or is that because we've kind of tinkered with the way we, that we mess with healthcare now in this country? Well, I think we're beyond tinkering. I mean, there's a lot of tinkering that still is going on, and there's nothing necessarily inherently wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But certainly on March 23rd of 2010, the passage of the ACA propelled us forward in a revolutionary environment in all dimensions in healthcare. So whether it's product development that's taking right. place on the right. research campus, whether it's employers certainly become, having a heightened sensitivity and thinking creatively about what they can do differently, whether it's the provider community focused on how can we increase quality and indeed lower cost, not just maintain the same cost level, or companies like ours, of how can we influence that through collaboration and, and creativity. Mm -hmm. All of that has been stirred and accelerated and propelled forward uh, since March 23rd of 2010, the day that the ACA was passed. That's not going to change, even if the Supreme Court which we will see what their judgment is in the coming weeks, by the last mm -hmm. Friday in right. June, right. would th throw out the ACA. The marketplace revolution is going to continue. It might affect the pace of it. It might affect a little bit of the direction. But the, the genie is out of the bottle in mm -hmm. that regard. Mm -hmm. And what we do know is that the daunting statistic that the CBO, uh, Congressional Budget Office, has provided us and have been consistent in this, that if the cost trajectory does not change, by 2020, one dollar out of every five dollars in our pocket will be spent on health care in this country. That's 20 percent of our GDP and beyond. That is an unsustainable economic model for us as a country. So the revolution is underway. I encourage all of us to engage in it, embrace the, the, the change, and to help figure this out. You know, Chris, we did this once before in North Carolina. In just a 30-second story, in, after, in World War II, more uh, draftees were turned down for military service from North Carolina than any other state in the country. Mm. Turned mm. down from serving? From serving. Mm. Because of their medical condition. What grew out of that was the good health plan. After World War II, the leaders of North Carolina came together and looked at that and said, that's unacceptable for North Carolina, mm -hmm. and we have to do something about it. And there are a variety of things that were done mm -hmm. at that point in time in the late 40s. 
that made a positive difference and moved us forward. Now, we're certainly not the healthiest state in the country, and we've got a long way to go. But my point would be that there was another time in our state's history where a revolution was necessary, and North Carolina embraced the concept, came together, figured out some solutions, and moved forward. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are now living in yet that time again. Yeah, Tim. You know, in South Carolina, we look at rural health care, um, and if you look at where we have a lot of our problems with health is in the rural areas, and quite frankly, the model doesn't work where every rural community has a full-fledged hospital. Right to provide treatment from A to Z. What, from a rural perspective, what do you see as a solution to the rural health care issues that we face? Well, we have the same issue here in North Carolina. We're very much alike in, in that regard. Uh, I think that uh, a, a tough conversation needs to be underway right now. Exactly what are the services that a, a rural hospital should be offering? Uh, should it attempt to be an academic medical center that offers all services, or should it focus on uh, a more immediate needs of the community and then having a relationship with a larger institution somewhere in proximity where uh, the, the more major cases can be moved? Number two, uh, I know that probably South Carolina is just like North Carolina. The, the question of Medicaid and Medicaid expansion. Mm -hmm. Rural hospitals essentially live off of the Medicaid reimbursement model. We can have a conversation about whether it's broken or not or what needs to change, mm -hmm. but in the meantime, um, the expansion of Medicaid would meet the needs of many rural uh, hospitals. I also think that we uh, need to have the providers in those communities. That doesn't necessarily mean doctors. Right. Yes, right. that's a good thing, but we, I know we here in North Carolina have programs that incent uh, doctors and other medical professionals to go and serve in rural communities for and in consideration of loan uh, forgiveness and that that sort of thing. But it's a, it's a very complex issue and one that the ACA is not going to solve. We have about two minutes left, Clay. Yeah, just real quick. So, so this term wellness, and I, I'm glad it's in the, the lexicon in America right now. I'm, I'm wondering, do you, do you like that term? And the reason I ask, it seems to be a lot of noise out there about uh, do this for, for your health or do that for your health. Is there kind of a shining example of an organization, an institute that Blue Cross Blue Shield says, you know what, they're getting it right. Is there an example that you can point to? Well, I do point to an example here in North Carolina in the employer context mm. uh, that uh, BB&T Mm -hmm. uh, has been a leader in uh, employer wellness uh, and uh, health risk assessments, all of the right. tools that are available to be deployed. And in fact, uh, BB&T, uh, I would point to them as being uh, maybe the, even the first mm -hmm. at a comprehensive approach, even well before the ACA, mm -hmm. and they see good results. Mm -hmm. um, we need to learn from all of the successful models. Right. And part of our responsibility as the state's largest health insurer is to identify what works the best, the fastest, in the most mm -hmm. cost-effective way and educate the employers and everyone who is interested on what works, uh, works best. Sure. You know, it was said a long time ago, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Sure. 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 And that's never been more true than it is today. You know, Brad, we got about a minute left, and this is going to be fair. It doesn't give it enough runway to talk about this, but you are one of the founding members of Best NC, which, which is going to uh, promote the policy around education in North Carolina. Do you feel like, can North Carolina get education right? You know, the GOP's taking a lot of heat. Seems like there's a surplus. Do you have confidence that the, the state's political leadership is going to be able to get this right? A absolutely. Uh, and quite frankly, it's not a choice. Uh, we must, we, we must get it right. And if you look at our history in North Carolina, uh, we have always risen to that occasion. If you want to go right. back to the establishment of the first public university in America, uh, all the way through to early childhood and, and smart start, and then of course funding our public school system, including our public university system, we have a heritage of doing that. And indeed, we can, uh, we, we can do it again. I would s suggest to you that while we talk about incentives, financial incentives are important, but building that educational, transportation, and quality of life infrastructure yeah. mm -hmm. 
is the margin of excellence. You know, that's got to be the last word, but that is, let's pick it up right there, and I mean it, because uh, we didn't talk about mental health either. There's there's more of a dialogue going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Brad, as always. Yeah, thank you. Good to have you Enjoyed being with you. Yeah. Yeah. Enjoy the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Clyde, good luck in the new job. Thank and you. And Ted, good luck in the new yeah, job. Very you. exciting for yeah. both of you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Till next week, uh, I'm Chris William. Have a good weekend. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.